This episode is brought to you by my friend Rebecca Walzer, a financial expert who can help you protect your wealth. Book your free call with her team by going to friendofdinesh.com. That's friendofdinesh.com. Hi, everyone. I'm your host this week, Danielle D'Souza Gill. Today is my last day hosting the Dinesh D'Souza podcast this year. It's been so much fun. It's been a wild ride through all of the crazy news that's come out this year. But we are ready for 2023 to take on even more of the left's craziness. And I am not tired in any way. And I'm just gearing up for 2023 and then, of course, 2024. So we can't lose hope. We can never give up on America. As we think about the new year in 2023, I ask myself, what will I do for America this year? As JFK once said, who would be a conservative if he were alive today? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. People are making New Year's resolutions, and one of mine for 2023 is simple. It's not so lofty, but it's simply to work through a new devotional this year. I find that setting aside time for the Lord every day is so important and is the key to starting your day anchored. In the busyness of life, it's sometimes easy to forget to do the most important things. So that's one of my New Year's resolutions. Today, we're going to speak with Paul Kengor about his new book. But before that, I will be giving out 2022 awards. And if you've been enjoying the content I've been putting out here, please follow me at Danielle D'Souza Gill on all platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Truth Social, Instagram, YouTube, Rumble. I also host a regular show on Epic Times called Counterculture with Danielle D'Souza Gill. So if you've ever checked out Epic Times, make sure to watch my show there. I would love to see you guys there. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. Have you ever picked up a towel set because it felt really soft in the store, but then when you go to use it, it's not very absorbent? It's basically a towel that's leaving you out to dry. That's why MyPillow has developed the MyPillow towels. Towels that work. I know, it's mind-blowing. Towels that actually dry you. Their six-piece towel set includes two bath towels, two hand towels, and two washcloths. They come in a variety of colors, and right now, you can receive a six-piece set for only $39.98 with promo code Dinesh. Go to MyPillow.com right now and click on the radio listener special. MyPillow products come with a 10-year warranty, have their 60-day money-back guarantee. To receive this amazing offer on the six-piece set of MyPillow towels, just go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener special, and enter promo code Dinesh. Or call 800-876-0227. That's MyPillow.com, promo code Dinesh. What some of us would do just to be young again, the simple things like climbing stairs, getting in and out of bed, and taking a walk aren't that simple. Too many aches and pains, but they can be because thankfully now there's 100% drug-free solution. It's called Relief Factor. Relief Factor supports your body's fight against inflammation. That's the source of aches and pains. The majority of the people who try Relief Factor order more because it works for them. Debbie can finally do the exercises she loves, like planks, push-ups, and her stationary bike, thanks to Relief Factor. It's been a game changer for her and for many people. You, too, can benefit. Try it for yourself by ordering the three-week quick start for the discounted price of only $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246 to find out more about this offer. That's relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246. Feel the difference. America needs this voice. The times are crazy and a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. Well, we finally made it. We reached the end of 2022. But before we begin to look forward to another year of dystopian corruption, let's engage in a little look back on the year that was in the form of an award show. Not just any award show. We're going to hand out awards to this year's biggest losers. Trash awards for the trashiest people and institutions whose contributions played a big part in the transformation of our country into a hellscape. The awards for the biggest losers this year signify decorations for dereliction, kudos for corruption, accolades for abuse, laurels for laziness, and trophies for terribleness. 
Our first category is the award for most ungrateful scold. Hands down, this award has to go to Meghan Markle, the former member of British royalty and professional crier when she's on camera. Meghan and her former prince of husband Harry, who claims to be a tortured soul himself, have renounced their obligations to the British royalty, but want to keep as much of their royal brand, money, security, and lifestyle as possible in order to start a kind of media grift knocking the British royalty. This was most aptly exemplified in their countless interviews, whether that be with Oprah or in their own multi-part documentary on Netflix. The only documentary to show a tortured couple living in a $30 million home in Montecito, yet who claim to be victims. And literally, no one on the entire planet gets why Meghan has chosen this course of action. If Harry and Meghan truly hated the media, as they claim throughout their documentary, then they could have chosen to live a quiet life out of the limelight, away from the media. But no, they love media attention, and a camera crew is Meghan's best friend. That's why she hired one to photograph her when she went to pay her respects to victims of a school shooting. Very heartfelt, Meg. And you can't let that photo op pass you by. I don't think this Netflix documentary will be the last time Harry and Meghan make a deal with the media for big money by conducting interviews where they shed some tears and try to grab headlines. Keep in mind, most people would have been happy to become a prince or princess and get paid to live a life of luxury and service, but not Meghan. She always wanted to be a Hollywood actress, her name in lights, center stage, and she knew that a life of British royalty was going to be too service-oriented for her. And she'd never ultimately be number one in England with Kate always ahead of her to become queen. Being royal wasn't good enough for Meghan. A literal fairy tale ending wasn't enough for her, so she's taken it upon herself to destroy all possible avenues for that and instead cut Harry off from his family. So she dragged Harry out to California so she could be the celebrity, the actress, the activist she's always wanted to be. He was complicit too, don't get me wrong. He's just as much to blame as she is for the fake victim narrative. The only problem with Megan's dream of being an actress is she isn't that good at acting and her true colors have come out. Most people in the UK view her highly negatively and more people in the US view her negatively than Kate Middleton. She also only knows how to play one part, the part of the no, she made me cry, Karen. That Johnny One Note act can only last so long. Congratulations, Megan, on your award. And remember, always bring a tissue when you're about to cry about your hard life on camera. Runner up for this category goes to Jen Saki, who certainly knows how to scold America as if she's the queen know it all, and the rest of us are idiots who just ordered treadmills online. Remember when she made that comment during the supply chain crisis? Our second category is the award for biggest walrus of the year. Again, very little competition here. This award goes to former Trump attorney, General Bill Barr, and future food tray runner for Golden Corral. This is the person who confessed on camera that he was surprised to hear Biden discount as fictional, the story of his own son's laptop, full of crime, drugs, crime, corruption, crime, treason, and more crime. Bill Barr would have us believe that this shocked him, while at the same time, his own Department of Justice and FBI were working with social media companies to illegally suppress and censor a bombshell story that he himself admits was 100% true. Congratulations, Barr, on your role in backstabbing the American public and smothering elections with your bare hands. What was the bribe, Bill? A box of Krispy Kremes? Remember, Bill, always wear a hairnet when around food. Runner-up for this category goes to Alexander Vidman, who was disqualified on the basis that he may not even be real. After serving as a deep state puppet for the failed impeachment of Donald Trump, his Twitter account was caught red-handed spewing the same stock statement that a host of bot accounts had also posted. So suspected person Alexander Vidman could be a puppet or a robot. More research is required. Our next category is the award for worst violation of trust. This was actually a crowded field, but this award has to go to the media, if only for the sake of raising awareness. And that's largely because the media itself has yet to admit that the jig is up. They're still pretending the incredibly damning Twitter files were never released. Unfortunately for them, there is already copious evidence that, like Twitter, Facebook, Google, and everyone else, they too were taking marching orders directly from corrupt government overlords. You may ask yourself, how can we know this? After all, there are no CNN files or MSNBC files yet. 
Well, the magic ingredient here is logic. Note that over the past few years, the only outlet to complain of censorship was the New York Post, specifically in relation to the Biden laptop story, published by the New York Post. Now consider two facts. One, no other outlet complained of being censored. Two, there were a host of highly important stories which could have broken but weren't. Stories having to do with coercive state power in the fields of disease, medicine, and elections. In other words, the kind of stories any real journalist would have jumped at the opportunity to break. But not the mainstream media. What did we get from them? Silence. Silence on these bombshells and not a peep about being censored. Silence gives consent. I think it's pretty safe to say that the reason the mainstream media is hiding from the Twitter files is the same reason they've never complained about being censored and the same reason all their stories line up exactly with the narratives of the deep state. They're in on it. And as a wise meme astronaut once said, always has been. Runners up for this category of worst violation of trust goes to the RNC leadership, generally, and Dr. Fauci. Naturally, we also considered the U.S. government. They were ultimately disqualified because you have to put your trust in the government in the first place in order to violate that trust. And speaking of lack of trust, let's get right to our next category, Kangaroo Court of the Year. Again, this was a crowded field. It is Biden's America, after all. But ultimately, this award goes to the entire D.C. Federal Court District. Located at the heart of American corruption in our nation's capital, this swamp court district will be forever remembered as one of the most egregious examples of injustice in the history of our country, rivaling even the memory of the most bigoted courts in the old Deep South. D.C. has proven that its judges carry some of the most extreme and unhinged biases a depth of prejudice that can only be rivaled by the juries. How else can you explain the fact that they take seriously the claim of the Department of Justice that a protest which dispersed peacefully in time for curfew should be treated as a violent military action that almost toppled our government? This premise wouldn't even pass as a plot device on a Netflix series. You also have to take into consideration that the same Department of Justice bringing these charges is responsible not only for making up every story about Alpha Bank, Russian collusion, and the Steele dossier, but they also actively hid the fact they knew it was all made up for years. And for some reason, the judges still all pretend like this very same organization is as pure as the driven snow when it comes to bias against Trump supporters. The D.C. district courts are so biased that a conservative can be sentenced to years of jail for having unapproved thoughts while the corrupt liars behind the Steele dossier, prosecuted under Durham, get off on the technicality that the jury couldn't possibly read their minds. Every outcome is predetermined, and the law only works in one direction. Congratulations, D.C. Federal Court District. Like I said, they had some tough competition. Runners-up include any court that tried Alex Jones. These are the courts that made ridiculous demands that Jones pay penalties larger than the GDP of most countries. Another runner-up is, of course, Maricopa County Judge Peter Thompson, who believes chain-of-custody laws are mere suggestions and that a law which does not require proof of intent, in fact, requires proof of intent. Finally, a reward for biggest self-own. This has to go to disgraced former FBI attorney James Baker of Twitter, who was caught red-handed trying to cover up the FBI's involvement in directing state censorship when the idea that the FBI could have been involved in covering up that story was still a hypothesis. So thanks, Jim, for proving the point even before the question could be asked. Runners up in this category are also numerous. We have Yoel Roth, who defended Twitter's policies only to be caught facilitating the termination of the account of the U.S. president, an action which he himself thought baseless. We have Hollywood, who still can't take a hint that their woke sermons are the worst substitute for actual stories and as a result lost billions of dollars. Disney alone lost $50 billion and is still doubling down on dumb. Maybe they're aiming for a 2023 Biggest Loser reward. Tune in at the end of next year to find out. The liberal majority also came close to continuing as the thought police, but fortunately Elon Musk threw a wrench in their censorship game. Today, everyone knows any semblance of the popularity of leftism on social media is the result of highly curated narratives and censorship of their popular ideological adversaries. Now that they don't control the narrative on Twitter, they no longer defend Twitter by saying, hey, it's a private company. 
They now want Twitter itself censored, and even Elon Musk investigated. But that's less of a self-own and more of a got-owned by people who value things like truth, justice, and the American way. Honorable mention for biggest self-own goes to the local San Francisco media for fawning over two obviously fake Twitter employees, Ligma and Johnson. Ligma and Johnson pretended to be engineers fired by Elon Musk. The supposedly tech-savvy media missed the fact that their made-up names were obvious references to meme culture and so utterly be clowned themselves in the process. That's all I got for awards for now. We hope you enjoyed our first annual Biggest Loser Award show. And hey, if you liked my awards here, please let me know on social media. I'm at Danielle D'Souza Gill. And let me know what you thought. Is there a category you'd like me to add for next year? If you're watching this on YouTube or Rumble, we'd like to hear from you in the comments. These are tough times indeed. The effects of inflation and bad government policies, plus rising crime across the country, have many people worried about the future. My friends at AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, are here to help. AMAC is the benefit program for conservative American seniors. AMAC provides countless discounts and benefits to alleviate the pain of inflation. They also offer advisory services on Medicare, financial planning, and Social Security. And while you are saving money, AMAC Action is working to save America. AMAC Action is working daily to maintain liberty and hold lawmakers on Capitol Hill accountable. Becoming a a member of AMAC is easy, and anyone can join for just $16 a year. So do something good for yourself and for America. Go to amac.us slash Dinesh right now. Dinesh and Debbie are proud members of AMAC. You should be too. Go to amac.us slash Dinesh and join with millions of other freedom-loving Americans. You hear me talk about the amazing benefits of taking balance of nature every day. There are so many satisfied customers, Dinesh and Debbie included, who tell stories of how balance of nature has been one of the healthiest decisions made this year. Balance of Nature has decided to do something special for those of you who are ready to get this maximum nutrition that people are talking about. Their founder, Doc Howard, often talks about the benefits of combining their star product, fruits and veggies in a capsule, with their fiber and spice supplement. So he's giving you a way to get both at a special holiday price. Right now, as a special holiday offer, get $25 off plus free fiber and spice with your first preferred order of fruits and veggies when you use discount code America. This offer can end at any time, so don't delay. Balanceofnature.com and use discount code AMERICA. I'm delighted to welcome to the podcast Paul Kengor. Paul is a professor at Grove City College, a commentator, and the author of many best-selling books. His most recent book is titled The Devil and Bella Dodd, One Woman's Struggle Against Communism and Her Redemption. Paul, thanks for joining us. Yeah, Danielle, it's good to be with you. Thanks so much. Paul, it looks like you're staying warm in your log cabin. You said you're in <laughs> Pennsylvania. How was the I blizzard am. for you there? Oh, it was terrible. Yeah, it was absolutely brutal. It was like, like 10, 20 below wind chill and just uh, just really nasty. In fact, I have I have chickens and turkeys. I have a few we have we have a few animals. Yeah. And it, taking care of animals in a situation like that is just brutal. <sighs> what did so, you do? It's a lot warmer today. Well, you just have to cover them up, put a tarp over where you can. You add like lights and heat lamps and you have to struggle to keep their water from freezing. And then you got to keep yourself from freezing. Yeah. But, uh, but it's it's not fun. That kind of weather is just nasty. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm glad <laughs> it's warming up now, hopefully. And you made it through the worst part. Made it through. Made it through. Oh, good. Well, I'm excited to see you. I remember that you were in my dad's first movie, 2016, right, right. Obama's America. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And he, in fact, he interviewed me from, I was in Pittsburgh. I was at a uh, an inn, a and b I think, in, in Pittsburgh on the south side. And we did it from there. So we did it like a phone call where the camera was on me in a room in the B&B. And then your dad, I think, was maybe on the beach in San Diego or, or mm-hmm. somewhere in California. So he was on the other line on the phone. And so we were, we were like having a phone conversation. And we actually were having a phone conversation for real, right? But it was videotaped and recorded as a phone conversation talking about Frank Marshall Davis, who was Obama's mentor. In fact, that fits right into what we're talking about today. Um, Frank Marshall Davis was a member of Communist Party USA. 
And in fact, this Communist Party USA number was 47544. I mean, we have the guy's number, FBI file, his security index information, everything. And he was, it's kind of an interesting question, Danielle. I'm only thinking about this now. Would he have <laughs> Bella Dodd? Um, no, I don't think so. Because Frank was in Chicago, and then he eventually went on to Honolulu, where he did the party work there. And he referred to the Communist Party there, the underground Communist Party, as the church. Oh. So this kind of like religious um, undertones, overtones to, to, how, to how he saw communism. And it was there in Honolulu that he met Barack Obama. He was introduced to Obama by Obama's grandfather, Stanley Dunham. And so Obama had this 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 mentor who was literally a hardcore member of Communist Party USA. So that's wow. what I talked to you about in the in the in the documentary. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think it's just it's so interesting because um, a lot of people didn't know a lot of things about Obama, and so now we're just like, oh yeah, of course we know all these things, but. It's just right. so interesting because Obama really was so different than previous Democrat presidents like the Clintons and, and others. And so I think people just couldn't believe that he was such an activist and, and so much more left wing. Well, and, and really, it, so it, in fact, so I, I should mention, I did a book on this. It was called The Communist. And that was the title of the book, The, po the Communist, uh, brought Frank Marshall Davis, Barack Obama's mentor. And uh, it, the, the radical associations that Obama had growing up, I, he would have struggled to get a security clearance if he, if he had applied for a federal government job, let alone become elected president of the United States. <laughs> and so, 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 I mean, in those days, the Democrats that had been elected had been people like, like Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, kind of moderate Southern Democrats. And even Joe Biden ran as like a, a moderate Democrat from you know, old Scranton Joe from you know, north northeastern Pennsylvania. But electing somebody as far to the left as Obama was a totally different thing. And we tried to tell people that at, at the time. And of course, we just got attacked for it. Your dad got attacked for it. But yeah. but Obama was an altogether sort of you know, different political, ideological animal. We never had anybody that radical as president of the United States before. Right. And I guess the only way you get that kind of immunity is becoming president because then I yeah. guess people can't go after you, or at least right, that was the right. case with the Clintons on, on some of their corruption. Um, but tell me a little bit before we get to your most recent book about your uh, Faith in Reagan book, because um, I think that one's really interesting. Yeah, the first book I did, actually, I guess it would have been the second one after my dissertation, which was published, but no one read the dissertation. But but it was a 2004 book called God and Ronald Reagan. And yeah, that book, it was it was a bestseller. It did it did really well. And that was the book that really showed a lot of people, including a lot of Reagan supporters, what they really didn't know. And that being that faith was an absolutely integral part of Reagan's presidency. And you know everything that he said, everything that he did, it, the you know, from the you know, the evil empire speech, speeches like that. I mean, that might seem more clearly like an example of it because he called the Soviet Union the focus of evil in the modern world. But Reagan's opposition to communism, um, his opposition to racism, uh, Reagan, the golden rule, learned that from his parents. Uh, you know, treat others as you would want to be treated yourself. Um, you know, love others as you would, as you would as you would want to. I'm messing up the golden rule. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> but 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 he was um, faith was absolutely integral to his life, and that was something that he got early in his life from his mother, Nell Reagan, who was with the Disciples of Christ denomination out of Northwestern Illinois. Uh, Reagan's College, Eureka College, was a Disciples of Christ denomination. College it was one of the original abolitionist colleges that I think there's maybe about 10 abolitionist colleges that are still around today. And that was one of them. Ray Reagan's was one of them. So if faith was really integral to everything that he did and he believed. He believed that that America was guided. In fact, Ray Reagan talked about uh, the uh, DP, the DP, the divine plan. He talks so often about this idea of a divine plan of the divine hand of God, divine providence guiding everything, that he created an acronym. He just simply called it the DP. So you know, that's 
that's how, again, integral faith was to everything that Reagan did and all that he all that he thought. Wow, that's fascinating. And um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of, I mean, it seems almost obvious, but I guess the evil of communism, because you've written a lot about communism and especially using the devil um, with communism. And I think so many of us know how evil it is because of the destruction and suffering it causes people. But can you maybe explain a little bit about what maybe drew you to that and, and kind of putting it with the devil in that way? Yeah. So, I mean, the atheism of communism has always been there. And in fact, um, you know, Marx said that communism begins where atheism begins. And, and, and Marx said in his famous Opiate of the Masses essay, he used the word criticism in there 29 times. And he said the criticism of religion is the beginning of all criticism. And, and in, which is actually, in a way, pretty profound, because he and Engels and others, others understood that, that if you really want to take down all the moral absolutes and start anew with everything, you had to take down religion. And in that Opiate of the Masses essay, he said, religion is the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions, the sigh of the oppressed creature. It is the Opiate of the Masses. So he went after religion. He and Engels, they published the Communist Manifesto, 1848. They went after religion. All subsequent communists did. Vladimir Lenin, the Bolsheviks, they, 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 that was really the founding communist state. But by the way, Ronald Reagan understood all of this about, about communism. It was one of the things that really he found appalling about communism was that institutionalized atheism. Lenin said, there is nothing more abominable than religion. All worship of a divinity is a necrophilia. He said, when I was a teen, I took the cross off from my neck and I threw it in the rubbish bin. So, so that was what they thought of religion. And yet at the same time, and Ronald Reagan talked about this, they treated communism as a substitute for religion. They ended up treating communist ideology like a kind of faith themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, Reagan said, well, yeah, Marxism, Leninism, that religion of theirs. Uh, Raymond Aron wrote the book, The Opium of the Intellectuals. So, so they removed traditional Judeo-Christian principles in religion, and they supplanted it and replaced it instead with kind of the faith of communism or Marxism-Leninism. Mm, and so many of those countries, too, that um, kind of went communist, Eastern Europe, they, they really became atheist countries. And it's really sad to see because, I mean, I guess Western Europe has lot, lost a lot of their uh, religious fervor also. But just when you go there, it's it's so, like, dead because there's just no religion there. And it's, it's just, it's, it's sad to see because Europe used to be such a, a place of, of people who had faith. And whether you're Catholic or Protestant, there there was so much, um, especially in the, the beautiful churches, there was so much uh, religious life. Well, H H Hilaire Belloc once said, the faith is Europe and Europe is the faith. And I mean, so Europe, you know, Rome is the home, obviously, of the Catholic Church. The Protestant Reformation took place in, in Western Europe, Martin Luther, Germany, um, John Calvin, John Haas, uh, you know, the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg door. Yeah, Western Europe was, was the home of it. And kind of really, I think, Danielle, the shocking difference between Western Europe and Eastern Europe the Western Europeans have kind of thrown off religion now voluntarily, uh, whereas the Eastern Europeans under communism had a religion forcibly taken away from them. So, so yeah, that's that, that's a very big difference. And in many ways, some of the more religious countries in Europe today are countries that were under communism, like Poland, for example. I mean, Poland is still very heavily Roman Catholic, but outside of Europe. The communists, wherever they went, they pursued what Mikhail Gorbachev called, disapprovingly, he didn't approve of it, but called a war on religion. He, he said our predecessors pursued this brutal, wholesale war on religion. He said there was no justification for it, but they did it everywhere they went. So they did it in the Soviet Union. They did it behind all the Iron Curtain countries in Eastern Europe. Then Mao Zedong did it in China, uh, in Afghanistan. They did it to Muslims, and uh, they did it to Buddhists in Cambodia. Probably the most religious country in the Western Hemisphere outside of the United States had been Cuba. Cuba was a very, very religious country. 
And they went there and they they made atheism the law of the state, persecuted religious believers, shut down churches. And this is ironic. Uh, uh, Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, was once known as the Jerusalem of the East. I mean, that's wow. that's how reli- religious North Korea was. So you, you, they they go after uh, Bolshevik Russia. Russia was a very religious country. It, it's if 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 the devil is in the details here, right? If this is really a spiritual war, I think it's more than ironic and not a coincidence that the communists would go after these countries where religion had deep roots. You know, mm-hmm. holy countries, I don't know about holy, but devout countries of people trying to pursue holiness. That's where they went. And that's where they've had some of their um, worst successes. Oh, my goodness. And it's also it's interesting because you brought up the opiate of the masses. And I agree to I, why well, I think that there would be a much better America, for example, if we had a religious revival, if we had a great awakening, more people actually cared about God or at least striving towards something um, to make America better. But in some ways, I feel like, not that he's like right, but in some ways, I feel like at least a watered down version of Christianity kind of gives people this idea that, oh, like, I don't really need to do anything. I don't need to care or take action because it's all going to be okay. But at the same time, aren't really um, that religious. So it's almost like this kind of in-between opiate situation. Um, yeah. I don't know if, well, he, if that's something you've, what your reaction would be to that. No, I think I know what you're getting at. In fact, Vladimir Lenin said that for them, the, the worst priest was, was a faithful priest. Uh, mm-hmm. What they wanted was a corrupt priest. In, in, in fact, the, the more corrupt that the clergy was, the better it was for communists. They could exploit that. They could put those people on trial. They could they could do major propaganda campaigns. For the really holy uh, bishops and cardinals, they did massive, what they call desinformatia, that's the Russian word, disinformation campaigns. They would take people like Pope Pius XII, who was this stalwart great pope for the Catholic Church, and they labeled him Hitler's Pope. So that moniker, Hitler's Pope, was actually first started by Stalin and the Soviets in a Radio Moscow broadcast in July 1945. Uh, they, they would take any clergy, any cardinal who they wanted to smear and accuse them of Nazi sympathies, of fascist sympathies. They even did this to Carol Wojtyla, Cardinal Carol Wojtyla, who became Pope John Paul II. So it's kind of standard operating procedure. And like the left in the United States, which just kind of flip out, flips open the playbook, right? Says, oh, yeah, what, what, so what should we call this guy? What smear should we say? Oh, I got it. Racist, <laughs> right? Mm. Uh, bigot. Uh, in, in fact, Bella Dodd, when Bella Dodd left the Communist Party in July 1948, she gets a call from, from the, an Associated Press reporter. We talk about this in the book. We open one of the chapters in this. And the AP reporter said, Dr. Dodd, we have a statement from the Communist Party about your expulsion. It says here that you are anti-Negro, anti-Puerto Rican, anti-Semitic, pro-Nazi, pro-fascist, just on down the line. I, I mean, if Danielle, if they had had anti-trans in that day, right, uh, anti-gay, they would have thrown that into But they went right to the playbook. Um, Anti-Negro, yeah, that's the word they use for the day, right, of course, for anti-Black. Uh, Anti-Semitic, anti-Puerto Rican. They, they've been doing this for 100 years. And it doesn't matter if it's true or not. They just throw it out at you. And then in the case of someone like Bella Dodd, Almost 75 years later, uh, here I am as one of her biographers having to explain that, no, she wasn't any of those things. That's mm-hmm. just what the left does. They, they attack and smear and character assassinate like that. And I should add that in Bella Dodd's case, because she had been a master organizer for the party herself, she said, you know, this hurts, but I did the same thing. Mm-hmm. I did this to Congressman Hamilton Fish. I did this to Senator Rapp. I did this to this person, that person, that person. Now they're just doing it to me. And so she was, in a way, getting a a taste of her own medicine. Mm. 
Wow. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of, I think, was it Robespierre? He was, you know, doing all these violent things against people who were who were dissenters, who weren't radical enough and in France. And then kind of the same thing happened to him in the end. Not the same story, yeah. but kind of no, they like, come you know, you own. end up eating your own because it's like so radical and and, and violent. Um, what was kind of your inspiration for wanting to be her biographer and, and write her story? Well, the, the main person here is my co-author, Mary Nicholas, and she is an MD, medical doctor from Maine, and she's followed Bella Dodd her entire life, realized that there had never been a biography done of Bella Dodd, which is kind of crazy that that's the case, but that's how it ended up. And I would say, Danielle, that Bella Dodd is, if not number one, one of the top two or three uh, most famous female ex-communists in the history of America. And she was kind of like a female Whitaker Chambers. So so the I, the fact that there's never been a biography of her, I think, is, is kind of flat out astonishing. She she started working for the party in the 1930s, became a communist at Hunter College and Columbia University in New York in the 1920s, ended up joining the party as an open member, card-carrying member in 1943. Same year, by the way, that Barack Obama's mentor, Frank Marshall Davis, joined the party in 1943. And she she was a master organizer for the teachers' union, the teachers' front, the education front. And that had caught my eye. I knew about that years earlier. And the other thing that I had known about that really struck me about her was was that she said, and this is something that we track down in the book to pin down the the fact that she actually said it, that she helped place, quote, over a thousand communist men, unquote, in Catholic seminaries beginning in the 1930s. And I knew from other research that I've done, other books, including the book, uh, The Devil and Karl Marx, the longest section I have actually is on this. I knew that communists had infiltrated the mainline denominations, the Presbyterian Church, the Episcopal Church, United Methodist Church, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, totally controlled, totally penetrated, all the churches behind the Iron Curtain. And I knew I knew what they were doing, American communists to American churches. So I already knew about all of that. I knew about the different various congressional Senate testimonies from ex-communists who talked about that under oath. But Bella Dodd's story is so unique because she talked about how they targeted the Catholic Church, and in particular, how they um, tried to place, again, as she put it, over a thousand communist men in Catholic seminaries. So it's really <laughs> just a kind of kind of an outrageous, scandalous effort that they engaged in. Now, exactly how, how many of those men got through and by the end became priests or corrupted priests or pro-communist priests or atheist priests who were secretly members of the Communist Party. That, unfortunately, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. All right. But the fact that they went to her to do this, which is not a surprise, given her master organizing abilities, um, is itself pretty striking and I think uh, pretty significant. Wow. So they really wanted to infiltrate by saying, you know, we're going to put our own people, we're going to have them infiltrate the Catholic Church so they can be I guess we would say today woke, but back then, you know, communist priests. And that's really scary because the church itself, I'm sure, has has its, has its own issues of, of infiltration and, and things like that. And oftentimes the best people, the best priests and maybe the best pastors, too, don't get, you know, recognized. They are not the ones who always make it necessarily. And some of the other people end up being the ones who know how to get to the top of the system. Well, and it, and it doesn't take many. I, I quote in the book Manning Johnson, who I've quoted a number of times in different books, and he was a, a fascinating, heroic figure. He was an African-American ex-communist who, by the way, never left his church. So, and that was key, Danielle, whereas other communists were already atheists, all right? He got tugged toward the party for whatever reason, when he went when he went to New York, he still was a member secretly of his Baptist church. So I think those lingering Christian roots really really helped teach him that he shouldn't be any part of communism whatsoever. But Manning Johnson said he said it was it was an axiom of communist organizing that if you can only get one percent 
of a, of a group's membership or leadership that was all you needed to infiltrate and subvert and take over the group. And wow. he said, he said this to Congress, if you had a group of 10,000 members, all you needed was 60 to 70 hardcore, disciplined, organizing, collaborating communists, and you could hijack the organization. 60 to 70 out, out of 10,000. That's all wow. you needed. And Bella Dodd, for the teachers union in the state of New York, that they had 10,000 people in the, in the teachers union, and she placed 1,000 to 1,500 communists in the New York State Teachers Union. And it was so transparently obvious that the union had been hijacked that the New York State Legislature in Albany held these long hearings on the infiltration of the teachers union. In fact, that's when Bella Dodd went, went out and um, did the character assassination of Rapp and Coderre, the, the senator, the two legislators that, that headed that committee. But like Johnson said, and like Bella Dodd and others understood, and if you think about this, people watching think about this, it, it, there there will be a good organization out there and think of whatever it might be boy scouts um i don't, I don't know nfl <laughs> I don't, whatever it might be all of be. the and, traditional yeah, ones yeah and and all it will take is a few people inside of a certain political ideological bent and you'll, you'll be watching the tv or whatever thing why are they doing this why is it why are they doing why are they doing um, an NFL is gay ad campaign, right? Just play football. Mm. Stay out of this. Stay out of this junk, please. <laughs> I want to watch. I want to watch sports today. I, I don't. I don't want to do ideology today, please. But all you need is a handful of kind of discipline. And I'm not saying the NFL has communists in it. I'm not. I, I'm just. I'm just no, talking about. You mean like I, woke activists? They exactly. Exactly. Infiltrate you more of the seven, corporate side. Right. That's right. Yeah, all you yeah. need is 60 to 70 within an organization of 10,000. Those 60 to 70 committed to whatever that cause is, usually something on the cultural, moral, social, political left. And and, and what happens, too, is the other 9,000 members get so disgusted by it mm. that they leave. And they right. say, well, I'm do it. I'm bad. But sometimes you need to stay and fight. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but a small, committed group can do that. And Bella Dodd recognized that. And and organizers in the Communist Party have always recognized that. Right. And it seems like, too, I wonder, could we not obviously do it to that level, but why can't people on our side do this? You know, we just had a few <laughs> right, dedicated right. people and we probably wouldn't use words like infiltrate or be maybe as like die hard about everything. Although, we do have to or, be or more organized and committed, but right, right. maybe to take back some of these institutions, because we're always wondering, how do we take them back? How do we take them back? And then we're just like, oh, it's never going to be possible. But it's, I guess it's because the people they still have running the institutions who are in them, like they are so hardcore and they have like steel walls. So it's like for us to infiltrate, it, it's going to be difficult. Whereas probably when they infiltrated, we were like, oh, a different perspective. Let's discuss yeah. or Things like that. And so we just didn't have that intensity. Well, that's right. And 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 for them, I think intensity is part of it. And here again is the irony of the religion, right? Uh, often these people, and especially with communists, they were said to be atheists, which they were in terms of not believing in God. But their cause, they treated with such a religious-like fervor mm -hmm. that they could get up every morning. And from the moment they get up until they go to bed at night, they're dedicated to this cause, right? right. So, so in in a way that a Christian or Jew might get up in the morning and read their Torah or their scriptures or their meditations, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, it, it, religion is a big part of who they are. That's their makeup. For these other people, it's this ideological cause that that's driving what they do. And then I should add this: uh, the atheists on the other side, especially in the communist movement were much more willing to engage in, 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 in flat out deception in a right. way that people on our side would feel dishonest about doing. So they would create, and Bella Dodd was a master of this. We have a full chapter just on her front group work. They would create front groups with names like the American League Against War and Fascism. You know, who could be against that, right? The American Peace Mobilization. If you look, in fact, they have it right here. I won't grab it. But it's a very thick 1944 
multi-volume, it's known as Appendix 9, report that was done by Congress on subversive groups in America. The, the most common word in the title of their groups is, is progressive, you know, mm. or, or they have the word democracy or democratic. They never call themselves you know, the, 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 uh, the Berkeley Community Forum for Marx and Lenin. Right, <laughs> right? of course. They don't do that. And yeah. that they would give their, their names, the, 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 co- the communist schools around the country were called the Abraham Lincoln schools. <laughs> The group that went that went to Spain and fought the fascists for the communists were called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. When they created their school in New York, they called it the Jefferson School. The, wow. the, this is the kind of laughable deception they engage in. But, and here's the sad thing, the biggest suckers of them all, the ones most easily duped by these efforts, were always religious left Christians. Mm. Always. Because mm. the other side knew which buttons to push. Oh, let's share. Let's redistribute wealth, social mm. justice. Um, you know, the, sounds so Jesus loving. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so that's how they were able to pull this off. Because the other side is trusting, naive, and doesn't think that people on the other side could lie like that. And when people on our side would say, you know, the people doing that organizing that group, I think these people might be communists. Then the communists would say, oh, they think they might be communists. Did you hear that? And then the people on the religious left would say, oh, yeah, right under every bed, McCarthyism. And they make fun of the anti-communists, people like me and your dad. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the left still does this. They still do it all the time. Yeah, they they'll make, make these Twitter accounts and I guess there are organizations that'll say, you know, we're just like moms for safety against right, like right. this and that and, and these other groups. And then I look into it and I'm like, it's all just like radical left stuff or it all just has BLM and things in it that have nothing to do with whatever the, the supposed cause was of the group. So the well, left well, definitely BLM learned some example. lessons. Yeah, yeah. In fact, if you read the memoirs of Patrice Cullors, the founder of BLM, uh, the, the intro, the preface is from Angela Davis, the most famous living female communist in America. And 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 uh, uh, Patrice has been very open. She says, Alicia and I, the co-founder of BLM, we are uh, we are Marxists, right? We we are well steeped in communist ideology. She's so been very open about that. But they don't. But but you know they don't say that in their labeling and their packaging. In fact, they even went to their website and scrubbed it of a lot of that earlier junk about abolition of the family and so forth because that was exposing them and just how far left they were. And then when people on our side would point this out and say, look, if you want to fight for civil rights, support the NAACP or something. You know, don't support this group founded by this woman who's a Marxist. Right. But, but the people on the left would just attack us for even pointing out or quoting Patrice admitting that she's a Marxist. So right. that's um, the, the, these things have been going on for 100 years. Oh, my goodness. Well, Paul, thank you so much for explaining all of this to us. And congratulations on your book, The Devil and Bella Dodd. And thanks for all of your insight. Well, thanks so much. And it was good to be with you. Well, that wraps up our last show for 2022 for the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. It's been so much fun hosting the podcast and make sure you all have a happy new year and stay warm and stay safe this year. I will see you in 2023. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.